Welcome back to camp meeting. I once again have to say that I praise God. I'm thankful to the Lord for the Oregon Conference and the vision of this administration, the leadership of this field, to host camp meeting in this simple way, to make it possible for many other fields who are not able to host a camp meeting so that many of us can fellowship together. This is indeed a time of critical emergency in our nation. I'm going to say that one more time. Please look at me. This is a time of critical emergency in these United States of America. You also need to know equally the exact same emergency is in the nations of all the rest of planet Earth. So it's not a unique thing. It is real. This virus is a true biblical plague. This is a pandemic where Jesus said in Matthew 24, you shall hear of earthquakes in diverse places. You, you will see disasters. Then he says pestilence. See, a pestilence was a pandemic because people would die so quickly. There simply wasn't enough time to bury the large number of deceased. So the stench of death would fill the land. A pestilence was a pandemic. And Jesus said that was part of what we would see. So we cannot be surprised. We must look with solemnness at the reality that prophecy is being fulfilled. This is not a moment for us to be distracted by debate. For example, uh, some people are concerned that it affects our religious liberty to have the government say churches should not meet and cannot meet. You need to know something. I had an office that I operated in the United States Congress for four years during the 1990s. Uh, you're looking at someone who was personally involved with religious liberty issues in the Senate and the House of these United States. And I was well known in the hallways. Members of Congress knew what the position of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was, along with other mostly lawyers who represent our denomination and religious liberty offices that would communicate. But I, I had an office right there on campus and access to the tunnels underground that takes you to all the other buildings so you can go to see the members in their own offices or on the main floor of the House or the Senate. And I argued always for religious liberty. One year, I think it was 1999, there was a bill before Congress that involved religious liberty. Uh, and I remember calling the White House, the, the Director of uh, Legislative Affairs, and saying, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to throw its support behind this bill. Our president has written a letter that has been, is going to communicate our position because, as you know, the Adventist church stands strictly for religious liberty. No questions, no, no debate. That's who we are. And the White House official told me, well, that guarantees the passage of the bill. You see, so it is that person saying to you that over this virus, it is not about religious liberty. It is about staying alive. I, as I speak, I have colleagues who are ill. At last night, moments before coming onto this platform, I got a phone call from one of my physician friends. His father suddenly took worse with the illness. He, was, he tested positive last week, but this second week, he's now hospitalized. And I spoke with his brother, and, and there, there's great fear in the family. This is very real. There was a pastor who announced, my God is greater than this virus. And he was right. God is greater than anything and everything we face. He announced to his congregation, my God is greater than this virus. And they all said amen. And they trusted their pastor. He came down with the virus. And he quickly died. And a number of church members were infected. And suddenly there was pan this panic in the congregation. This is for our good. Please look at me. This is for the good of our people. We must be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Sometimes Jesus himself had to cry out, but not my will, but your will be done, O Lord. So, so we're looking at a reality in which we must use judgment. 
if, if Oregon has been spared the largest portion of the infections, then you need to praise God for that. Others of us come from where there have been tens of thousands of illnesses and thousands of have passed away, including friends of mine and colleagues. And this is real. So I want to praise God Almighty that God's people have camp meeting coming out of Oregon Conference so that the people of the Lord in safety can participate in worship and other fields who could not host their camp meetings can suddenly link in as well. And other souls who are seeking for answers have a place to see the face of God. That's why I congratulate Oregon Conference. And it, I, I'm glad to know where Pastor Mark Wittes is. He's one of the treasures of Adventism. And I'm excited to know that he's here. I, I love this man. I, I, of course, there's many pastors and laymen and leaders of this conference who have been friends for decades. And I'm just so honored to be here. Because tonight we're talking about the power of giving. See, service is based on the principle of giving. And giving comes from the power of forgiveness. My biblical hero, his name is Joseph. And of course, that's Jose in, in English, uh, just coincidental. But uh, Joseph was born to Jacob, the great patriarch, whose name was changed to Israel. And from there came the worship of God as, as the Lord confirmed his promise that from your loins shall come a great nation. And came the worship call as the people of the Lord uh, were led in the sacrifice by Yisrael, Jacob. El Elohim chad Yisrael, Baruch Hashem Adonai. And the people would respond, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. The power of coming together with this one man, a flawed man, Jacob was not one of the saints of Scripture, but he was a man called by God, like men and women are called today as well. We may not be saints, but we can hang out with the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, the reason why the choir of heaven sings. We get to be with him. That was Jacob. He had 12 sons. And uh, his 11th, Joseph, was precious to him. But, you know, we, we always think of Jacob and his preference for one son over the other 10 or the other. But we must flip that story and realize that Joseph was faithful. That kid served his father with conviction. He gave himself to his father's will. And if, the, and if Jacob said, I need those 30 goats moved over there, Jacob, uh, uh, Joseph saw to it. If these sheep need to be moved to that pasture, Joseph saw to it. Whatever it was, whether they were sheaving wheat, Joseph was the most obedient. His brothers would slaughter a lamb from time to time and try to cheat it past their dad, but Joseph would never do that. He gave of himself so freely that it created jealousy among others. And you'll find that at church. You'll find that at work. People who give of themselves so completely that others become, and we call it professional jealousy. But it's equally destructive to any other jealousy. So we don't know how to reward good work. We don't know how to reward being a good daughter or a good son because that's called sibling rivalry. People get jealous. Joseph gave of himself completely to his father. And he served him totally, ethically, absolutely. Well, one day with that kind of a blessing comes a further blessing from God. Joseph began to have dreams. And he saw what was to come in the future. He could actually see the horizon. And he told his brothers, I, I dreamt that as we were sheaving wheat, all of yours fell before mine. And, 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 and the, the stars, all of you bowed before me. And they told their father, see, dad, he's got problems. 
But you see, this young man was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit because he gave of himself to his father and to his God. You see, that worship that Jacob led his people in became the worship of Joseph. The power of the simplicity of being a servant of God is that when you are faithful, listen carefully, those are those two or three of you who take notes in the entire continent at this moment. When, if you are faithful, anything your hand touches will flourish. I was told that as a young man, only recently, I was told as a very young man, that if you are faithful, son, the person told me, anything your hand touches will flourish. It was true. It's still true. If you are faithful, anything your hand touches will flourish. For the hand of the Lord will come upon you and you shall perform his will. And so Joseph's brothers had enough. And one day they, uh, the, uh, Jacob sent the ten brothers, the older brothers, off to a place to, to tend to the sheep for about a month because that's where the greener pastures were. And, the, and the, the, by then, uh, Jacob had given Joseph a coat of many colors to honor him as the heir, the next in line, although he was number 11 in the birth order. And it should be the number one son, the oldest. But Jacob names Joseph the heir and gives him a, a beautiful mantle of many colors, hand-woven with dyes that are not found in those deserts, imported from some other country. Well, by now these men said, you know dad's going to send Joseph out here. Why don't we go to Dothan? And jo Joseph will never find us. And true to form, the, the Bible tells us that Jacob... Uh, formed a basket and filled it with burritos. Well, I mean, it is uh, pita bread, which we all know is a tortilla. I don't know why they call it pita bread. It's not a falafel. It's a burrito. Now, I, I know it doesn't quite say that. Those of you who are sticklers for exactness, I know, I know. But it's fun to think about it that way. He had a basket full of food for his brothers. He went to the place. It took two days' journey. They weren't there. And as Joseph looked around, suddenly a man appeared and he said, I think they said they were going to Dothan. Oh, okay. Thank you. And as Joseph turns around, the man that just told him they had gone to Dothan was gone. Now God was sending him angels to guide him. There are times the scripture says we have entertained angels and, 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 and we don't realize it. We have become so unbelieving. We have become so callous and so negative with each other that we've lost sight of the literalism in scripture that when God says there are times when you've had conversation with a celestial being, but we call that so far beyond reality. Why? Because you've stopped believing. And those who stop believing lose hope. And those who lose hope is because they don't believe. Belief and hope are one and the same thing. But if you are faithful, the Lord will lead you. Anything your hand touches, it'll flourish. Joseph approaches his brothers and immediately Simeon, his oldest brother, his second oldest brother says, Behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what becomes of his dreams. I've had it with my punky little brother. Let's do this, kid, man. Tell dad that a lion killed him or something. It was awful. As a poor Joseph come, approaches, yet it was his brother Reuben who says, oh, we can't have blood on our hands. This is our little brother. No, let's kill him. Let's kill him. And then finally, one of the brothers came up with a solution. There's a deep pit over here. Let's throw him in there for the night. We'll decide in the morning if we're going to kill him or not. But they threw him in the pit. That night, nobody could sleep. And in the morning, they saw a Midianite caravan coming by. And you, it was very customary. You can sell people as slaves. And this caravan was going to Egypt, a rich market for slaves. And, and so they pulled Joseph out and they sold him. His own flesh and blood sold him. Now we call it 
They sell them out. See how our vernacular comes from actual experiences? They sold him out. And Joseph found himself bound, arriving into Egypt to be sold at a slave market. Now think of this. If you are faithful, anything your hand touches will flourish. But that does not spare you from the evil and the terrible stuff that humans are capable of doing to each other. Remember that. Because some people say, well, I thought once I gave my life to Christ, everything would be good. It is good. But then those who listen to the other side, the darkness, they come after you. And many times they succeed in destroying us. But we still give of ourselves unto our Lord and unto our community, unto our church. We give of ourselves. That's what service is. It's the ultimate expression of giving. And it's powerful when you give. Joseph was purchased by Potiphar. He was the General Colin Powell of Egypt. He led the military forces and was the top advisor to Pharaoh himself. God on earth, raw incarnate, and his brother and sister, the moon and the stars. He was, he was believed to be a deity. Potiphar served him. So Joseph went to a household of one of the most powerful men in the world. And there, as he wept, he missed his father. He's just a teenager. Well, how can his brothers betray him like this? He's being beaten. He won't worship the gods of Egypt. He won't worship the Pharaoh. He only worships the Lord God of heaven. And he's suffering. He's suffering. He's mistreated. But he remains faithful. He gives of himself to Potiphar completely. Potiphar began to notice whatever his hand touches... It flourishes. And finally one day, he realized this kid can do pretty much anything. You see, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you often can do things you weren't even trained to do. For it is no longer you, but the Holy Spirit through you. Matthew 10, 19, Jesus told his disciples, take no thought how or what you shall speak if you're taken into custody by government forces for your faith. For at that moment... You will have words to speak because it's not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit within you. Even a pastor, a preacher, anyone who rightly divides the word of truth, we count on the Holy Spirit to speak. I'm too broken to be counted on for a proper sermon. We must listen to the voice of God today like never before. This is a disastrous time in the history of the world. We must come together. And if we are faithful, anything our hand touches will flourish. I had a coach who would say at that time, any questions? You see, Joseph was faithful. Pretty soon, Potiphar began to treat him more like a son than a slave. And, and, and then he noticed, uh, Joseph noticed in the sale of the horses, you could do better than this. They're cheating you. And, and those Arabian horses from next door can sell, fetch a huge profit. And, and, and before you know it, Potiphar was a billionaire because of his slave, Joseph, who loved God, who was faithful, even in the face of injustice, anything his hand touched flourished. Well, Sister Potiphar noticed him too. Shoulders, mm -mm -mm. green eyes and curly hair. Mm. And the scriptures tell us that she became confused about her needs and went after Joseph. And Joseph, like any good man, uh, knows that he has no strength of his own. He ran. Gentlemen, listen to me. Learn to run. Are you listening? Learn to run. Sister, learn to run when those temptations arise. And if you didn't, I have good news for you. God will forgive you. He'll restore you. Look heavenward again and be restored in his presence. He forgives to the uttermost to them who ask. Repentance is a good thing. Joseph, after Sister Potiphar tried one too many times, he ran and she was able to grab part of his raiment and then she accused him of assaulting her sexually. 
which was absolutely false. Potiphar was devastated because he was now on a process of nothing but prosperity at the hand of Joseph. I don't know anything about his God, but as long as he keeps praying to him, whatever his hands touch, it flourishes. He was faithful. He gave of himself. You see, that's the power of giving when you serve. It's not a debate. It's not just a theological construct. It's not a socialized religion. Or, or This is what Christianity is. This is what it looks like when people serve the Lord. They serve each other. And so Potiphar knew he was innocent because Joseph swore on his God. I mean, I swear by the God of Israel, I have never done anything to cross that line and insult your home. So Potiphar knew he couldn't kill him. That was instant death penalty. He just sent him to prison. Well, here's the problem. Pharaoh's prison, you stayed only three days. There was no such thing as a prison term. Within three days, Pharaoh would decide whether you get to live or die. And that's it. So you're going to prison for how long? Three days. Around here, we talk about three years. Oh, is that it? It should be 30 years. No other country in the world incarcerates more than the United States of America. For all the freedoms we have, we also have the largest number of inmates of any other nation in the world. Take that from someone who has family that is locked up. Brothers and sisters, Joseph found himself in that prison. And after the third day, there was no decision from the Pharaoh. Pharaoh wasn't even told about it. He languished there for seven years. Fast forward the tape. Play. All of a sudden, we see the prison had the freshest water. The food was so delicious, people preferred to eat at the jail than at the restaurant down the street. Why? Because although he was unjustly thrown into prison, he was devastated. He, was, he probably went through phases of depression at the abuse, at the false charges, at the betrayal that people continually did to him. Joseph clung to the Lord and continued to give him of himself now as an inmate. And, the, and the, anything he touched, whatever his hand touched, it flourished. Food was delicious. Never had an enchilada tasted like that in the history of Egypt. Talking about a serious sauce with just the proper amount of vegan cheese on top. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And a simple, small jalapeno pepper to one side. Amen. Allow me a Mexican moment. Joseph was filled with the Spirit of God. And you know what mistake we make, brothers and sisters? We think if it's in the Bible, it can never apply to us. The Bible is filled with stories of people just like you and me who were filled with the same Holy Spirit that you and I can have today. And we have been promised a latter reign of the Holy Ghost. It is time that we believe in something. Instead of arguing and debating theological constructs, isn't it time to see it active in our own life? I don't want to see us. I don't want to hear a sermon. I want to see it. Show me, Do We're all from Missouri. Show me. Show me what you mean. Quit talking. Show me the face of God. And Joseph languished in prison. Then one day, the Pharaoh's baker and his butler, the one who handed him his, his wine, were both thrown into the prison. For how long? Three days. Until the Pharaoh decides what to do. The Pharaoh's sacred bracelet was missing. Somebody had stolen it. And the seers believe that one of these two guys did it. Well, they both had dreams. The baker and the butler. Well, who had the gift of dreams? Joseph. Who's filled with the Holy Spirit? Joseph. Who's, who, who, who's so blessed that whatever his hand touches flourishes? Joseph. Who never stops believing in the Lord no matter how much betrayal human beings bestow against him? And he's innocent the whole time and it's life-altering destruction that's thrown at him every time? Joseph. 
He had a thousand reasons to say, I don't believe in God anymore. I serve him faithfully and stuff continues to happen. And there are people right now, you're, you admit it to yourself. While I am not a religionist anymore, I, I, I'm just watching out of curiosity. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't blame you. If you don't feel you're religious anymore, that's okay. Look at me. If you don't feel religious anymore, that's okay. Just know this. It is God who's very religious about you. He's the one who's religious about us. And we keep thinking it's about us needing to be religious for him. For God so loved us that he did everything necessary to restore us to eternity. And so these guys had dreams and Joseph he, he told the butler, what you dreamt was the, 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 the crushing of the wine and rest easy. Those three that you saw, um, that's three days. And in three days, you will be restored. You, you will be serving the Pharaoh again. And then the butler said, well, here was my dream. I had a wicker basket and I had pastries as I make for the Pharaoh. But birds began to eat them off my head. And, and, and it was three baskets. Oh, oh, Joseph. Did not feel good about it at all. Well, well, what does it mean? Well, three baskets are also three days. And in three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and hang you from the gallows. And the birds will eat your flesh. At that moment, the bracelet had been found. And indeed, it was in the possession, well, among the butlers, I mean, the baker's possessions back at his home. And he was hung. As the butler is leaving, Joseph said, perhaps you can plead my case to Pharaoh. Please remember my case. And the Bible says it very bluntly. The butler forgot Joseph. And that's how it'll be, brothers and sisters. Don't expect for things to go our way. Part of being human is that we go after each other. That's why our nation is also in trouble right now. We must come together listen to me look at me we must come together this is not a matter of debate anymore it is an emergency we must come together two years passed and then pharaoh had two dreams. In one, he saw fat cows coming out of the Nile River, which was the source of life in Egypt. And there was seven fat cows. And then seven thin, horribly looking, dying cows came out. And the, the thin cows killed and ate the fat cows. Very, very uh, frightening uh, dream. Because when you're there among the cows being slaughtered, I guess it changes your perspective than watching it from a distance. Then he saw uh, ears of corn and seven ears of lush corn, complete Nebraska times 10. And then there were seven shriveled ears and they destroyed and consumed the fat ears. And then uh, all of a sudden the butler remembered this day. Do I remember my sin? I forgot two years ago, Joseph in prison. And he whispers to Pharaoh, you would have the dreams of your Pharaoh interpreted by a Canaanite slave in prison. It was bad enough being a slave. But a slave in prison is lower than any lowest caste of untouchables ever to be heard of. Well, if you don't want to know, it's okay. Well, they brought in Joseph. And they told him first the dream of the cows. So the, the Pharaoh told him the dream of the cows. And, uh -huh. and then he says, was there another dream? It, and, and yes, it, it was about the shriveled ears. And Joseph says to him, those seven fat cows and seven fat ears are seven years of plenty. But in the scripture, it says also in Genesis chapter 41, the, the seven thin cows and the seven shriveled ears are seven years of great want and famine. There's no way around this. It's coming. Well, Joseph was confronted by an angry Pharaoh who at a single command can send him to his death. You don't anger Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was angry. And everyone was shocked that Pharaoh, while angry, 
did not raise his hand against Joseph. I guess he had to sleep on it, and he had his terrible dreams again. In the morning, he brings Joseph back. And uh, Joseph stands before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh asks, is there nothing we can do? And Joseph said, let Pharaoh appoint a good man, a just man, to oversee Egypt and collect one-fifth of all harvests for the next seven years of plenty that are coming. One-fifth of all harvests will be tribute to Pharaoh. Talk about a tax increase. There are times they are needed. And then there'll be the seven years of famine and all that grain that was saved for seven years will save Egypt and pretty much, and it turned out the entire Middle East. So in Genesis chapter 41, verse 37 onward, and the statement of Joseph to the king was, uh, the statement of Joseph was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his, all the servants in his palace. Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this is a man in whom the spirit of God is. When you are filled with the spirit, others will see it. They'll even tell you, you know, I'm not a religious person, but there's something different about you. Oh, man, I love, I love the Lord. I'm not a good person, but I hang out with a good God. I'm not strong, but I hang out with the Almighty. I don't know what to do, but he who knows all things lives right here. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all these things, there is none so discreet and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your word shall all my people be ruled. Only on the throne will I be greater than you, Joseph. Pharaoh said to him, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his signet ring where he would sign all documents and gave it to uh, Joseph and put it on his hand. And he arrayed him in vestures of finest linen and put a gold chain about his neck, which only one person could wear, the prime minister of the country. He made him to ride in a second chariot uh, of which he had. And they cried before him when Joseph would be riding through town, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without you shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph Zaphonath Panea. Zaphonath Panea. Say that really fast three times. Anyway, not, they don't have to try Zaphonath Penea means the Savior. The reason why this story overwhelms me is that look at the training of Joseph to become prime minister of Egypt, the most powerful nation on earth. He was betrayed and brutalized by his brothers and sold as a slave. He was a slave in brutal conditions and falsely accused after seven years of service. He was a slave as a victim in prison for a crime he did not commit. What links all three of those terrible, terrible things he went through? He loved the Lord, our God. He was brutalized by people for no explanation outside of the people can do terrible things to people. Yet he remained faithful. He gave himself in service. You see, giving is a powerful thing. My mother taught me, if you're going to give something away, give away your best. So my wife is always worried because if I give something... I, 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 I've worked for three different presidents uh, cooperating at the White House over the 90s and the early 2000s, both parties. I have quite a collection of White House memorabilia from the White House. No, I didn't steal it. Don't look at me that way. Although I probably fit the profile by appearance. And once in a while, I'll say to my friend or somebody, hey, I want you to have this. And I give him something that's priceless because the president gave it to me. 
And, and, and that's why my mom taught me, if you're going to give something away, give your best. Joseph gave his life, although he faced continual evil and mistreatment for no other reason than humans are terrible sometimes. He remained faithful. And remember, if you are faithful, anything your hand touches will flourish. But you won't be spared the terrible things that happen. So right now, we're suffering with COVID. We need to go out in the name of Jesus, not to be infected, but to serve the family of those who are suffering. And anything our hand touches in faithfulness will flourish. We need to bring comfort to the bereaved. We need to help those who are recovering. We need to be supportive of agencies that are making a difference. And if we're going to wear a mask, wear it because you could spare not only yourself, but in case you might be infected from having touched something somewhere else, you will not breathe it on someone else. This is a time to put ourselves aside and do what we need to do so that whatever our hands touch, it will flourish. Let's be faithful to our God. It is time that we repent of our sins. There are people who don't hear a sermon anymore to learn truth. They just hear a sermon to verify that this pastor uses Alan White correctly or something or, or shaves properly. We, we don't enjoy music anymore. We're busy evaluating the instruments or the style of music. Are you aware that the inspired writer tells us that the voice of Jesus, just his voice, sounds like many musical instruments? What's it like when Jesus sings? I mean, I, I can't wait because I'm going to get to hear that. How about you? You're not worthy. Neither am I. So let us cling to him that is worthy. And he will save us from our sins. Come down, O oh Lord. For we don't even know how to help each other in this time of destruction. Keep us from war, Lord. Save us from ourselves. Turn the hearts of the parents back to the children. Turn the hearts of the children back to their parents. Save us, Lord. We don't know how to save ourselves. We can't do it anymore. We give up. So you do it. You promised you would. We're holding you at your promise. You do it, Lord. And here we are. Use us to fulfill your ends. Send us. Teach us to give ourselves. And that we experience the power of giving. So that our hands, whatever they touch, it will flourish. Don't let him go. He has promised not to let go of you. And once again, those of you who are telling me right now from your living room out loud, looking at your phone or your laptop or your TV, I'm not a religious person. That's okay. He's the one who's religious about you. He has a plan. And he's not simply going to let us disappear. This is our moment. This is our time. President Ronald Reagan once said, it is now time. If not us, who? If not now, when? I think the president was right. If not us, who? If not now, when? An inspired person was once told, share this. Go, give of yourself and do this. If you don't, someone else will. I'll give it to the weakest of the weak. There's no time to be a coward. It's time to take a stand for Jesus. This is not a time to be separated by liberals and conservatives. This is not a time to be separated over music. This is an emergency, ladies and gentlemen. If this was a hurricane and we had 140-mile winds out there, you, you wouldn't have time to argue theology. we got to stay alive and help each other. It's time. Back on the streets, we used to say, so do it. What you waiting on is it. 
go do it, eh? Watch. You want to go outside? I'll pray with you, eh? I know it's because I'm from the neighborhood, not the residential district. See, the power of this is it shows you, it proves to you that even someone who is me or looks like me is a patriot who loves his country and loves his God and believes that if we give of ourselves, God can use anyone. So if he's used this broken man, how much more will he use you? It's your turn. I must now decrease and you must increase. Rise and fulfill your destiny. It begins with commitment to God. And then he'll lead you from there. We pause for technical adjustments. He will lead you from there. Remember when we were kids, we would play a, a, a game called tag. And someone would chase us and we'd make weird noises. And they finally catch up to us and they touch us. Tag, you're it. You mean I almost had a coronary while being chased and all, that's it? Tag? Yeah, it's your turn. Now you chase somebody and touch them. Tonight, the church tells you, Tag, you're it. We're not going to make it. Unless the promise movement rises. Lo, we have waited lifetimes for this day. Young people, young adult pastors, the Lord promised us you would come. An army of young people rightly trained and you would furnish the message of a crucified, risen and soon coming Savior. It's your time. We've had our opportunity. It's your turn. Rise, fulfill your destiny. The Lord has foretold this. I have waited my entire life for you. And other people, 60 plus, my colleagues and friends out there, grandparents and great grandparents who no longer have black hair. Isn't it true that we have waited for this moment? then let us support our young people. Quit criticizing their music because the music in heaven is going to be incredible. In heaven, there'll be no white choir or black choir. There's only one celestial choir that's going to come together. And I'm going to sing in that choir. <clears throat> I'm a baritone. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. I can hide among all those voices. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great will be our reward in heaven. If you're faithful, anything your hand touches will flourish. But it begins with a commitment. Hold to Jesus, I surrender. All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him In His presence daily live All to Jesus I surrender Humbly at His feet I bow joys of full salvation take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender Salvador a ti me rindo obedezco 
solo a ti mi guiador mi fortaleza todo encuentro Cristo en ti a tu causa me consagro y tu amor mi amor será Oye Cristo mi plegaria Quiero en ti tener perdón Yo me rindo a ti I surrender all All to thee my blessed Savior I surrender I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee, my blessed Savior I surrender I surrender I surrender all to you. I surrender all. I surrender let's go it's time enough talk show me what you believe it's not 28 fundamental beliefs that save us it's a relationship with Jesus that is understood in 28 fundamental ways that means those who serve the Lord our God will dedicate themselves in the power of giving. And the ultimate gift we give is of our time, of our talents, of our treasure. Always give. For if we are faithful and serve the Lord with gladness in the people made in His image, whatever our hands touch, it will flourish. Do it. Repent of your sins. Recommit your life to Him. And let us see an awakening, a return to primitive godliness as has been foretold. Let us see a movement, a final movement that a latter reign of the Holy Spirit can dictate and move as none of us can even imagine. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Bless your people once again. Make us faithful till the end. Save us, O oh Lord. Save us from ourselves. It is time for an awakening in our church, in Christendom, in our community, in our town, in our city, on our side of the ridge. It's time, Lord, that this Holy Spirit come to our property, not just the neighbor. Save us that we can share what salvation is for others. Save us that as this virus afflicts us, you can use us to relieve human suffering. Save us that we can avoid the dangers of war in our nation. Save us that we can now come together as congregations 
and see the impossible happen. The people of God coming together in unity. Save us. And these hands will belong to you. So that anything they touch will flourish. We pray in the name of Jesus and for his glory. For the advancement of his kingdom. Amen. Look at me. Go. Tell someone what you have seen here. Go in peace.